Paranormal Tours, GravesideParanormal.com, GravesideParanormal on YouTube. How's everybody like the tour tonight? Woo! This is Neil with Graveside Paranormal Presents Spirits by the Graveside. Today's date is 3-18-2021. This is going to be on Spotify, Anchor FM, and YouTube on the 21st, 3-21-21. So you can catch it out on uh, all those uh, fine little things. Now to start off, before we even get anything started, I like to always start off with the drink because it's called Spirits by the Graveside. But today I am drinking a thing called kombucha ammunition from Door County. It's actually pretty tasty. It's not too bad. I was trying the honey earlier. It wasn't too bad. So pop your top, take a sip, and then we'll get into the news. And God bless all who are here tonight. All right. In the news. Happy St. Patrick's Day weekend. Uh, I'm saying Happy St. Patrick's Day. It's been a great week for the Irish. I am an American Irishman. Uh, so I say to each and every one of you, Happy St. Patrick's Day. And for all my adopted friends, that means the ones that are out at the bars and having a really good time. You know, and uh, men finding women and women finding men and just having a good old time and uh, having those spirits. And Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody from uh, Graveside Paranormal. Moving on, Amityville news. We are just, the interview we did last interview was about Amityville with uh, Paul and Kit Proctor, uh, Garrett, Garrett Proctor. And what's odd about the thing is that Ryan DeFeo Jr. died this week. He died on the 12th. He was about 69 years old. He is the one who murdered uh, six people, his family basically, in uh, the Amityville Horror House that they call the Amityville Horror House. Uh, which was the DeFeo home. Um, yeah, it, it's a very weird and ironic, at least to me it is because we did an interview just recently about it. Uh, and it's a very good uh, interview. I thought it was a lot of fun. I had a great time. So check that out on our YouTube thing. If you haven't got caught up on any of the new things that we're doing, uh, check that out. That's a lot of fun. Also, a couple of things for Graveside Paranormal. Guess what? We're back. We are doing a Graveside Paranormal tour. We are going to be doing it on uh, May 8th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. We are bringing back our Tragic Innocence Tour. Tragic Innocence Tour, boys and girls, is basically all the young innocents who have died. And we're going to take you to different places. Of course, what we're going to do in Archer Avenue. We're going to make sure that we do over there. We're going to do many different other places that we're adding on uh, for our new tours that are be coming up in October. So we're going to be trying to come back and we're going to be hooking up once again with 115 Bourbon Street. Greatest place. I'm going to tell you something. That cream of chicken soup that they have there is awesome. Check out 115 Bourbon Street. Especially go there and go uh, go buy a couple of drinks. Take the one that you love out there. Because you know what? A lot of businesses were hurting. So if you can, make sure you come for the event. Uh, we are going to be doing uh, where people are going to uh, just have a damn good time. And that's the main thing. We want to bring people back out, go back outside and go have some fun. And that's why we're making a daytime tour because we're going to try to go inside a lot of these cemeteries. Uh, one of the other things that we'd like to bring up is this Friday on 319, we are, even though it's today that you're listening to this, on 319, we put up our investigation of the Sally House, which is in Atchison, Kansas. Now, that was a very, very weird place. That was on my bucket list of places to go uh, when I was a young kid, a uh, young teenager watching the old show Sightings uh, that was on um, uh, WFLD at the time. Way before it was called Fox, it was just WFLD. Uh, a couple of other things that we're going to be talking about is that we are going to be going out to the Roth House uh, on 5-1, and we're going to be going and investigating that. I think uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be me, my wife, um, it's going to be Michelle and Steve, 
and we're going to just have a good time. Uh, they have dinner. It's a bed and breakfast there at the Roth House. So uh, look it up, Google it, so you can get all your information that you need about the Roth House. Uh, he has, I believe, um, two different uh, menus. One's an Italian menu and one's a Mexican menu. Uh, we will decide before we go there, and then it'll be uh, uh, very interesting. I hear down in the basement that people always hear uh, someone, an older man, saying, get out. What did he say? Get out. Oh, that's what I thought he said. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to welcome in at this time Mr. Jack Chavez of Paranormal Chicago. How are you, Jack? I'm pretty good. How are you, folks? I'm doing pretty good. I cannot complain, sir. Uh, you're here uh, going to help us out with the Mothman today. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me, too. Of course, Jack. You're always welcome here, man. You're, you're a book of knowledge for me, man, and I always like a good book of knowledge. <laughs> And as usual, we always have our favorite. Uh, he is the one who created the Anahata Spirit Portal Box and the new Dewat Box, uh, which is a upgraded Anahata Box. Presenting Steve Lineweber, Graveside Paranormal. What's up, Steve? Hey, everybody. How's hey, it going? Hey, everybody. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hi, Jack. You know, tonight, I'm a little bit nervous about the show. Why is that? My mom is going to be listening. Whoa. So get this, Neil. What's I that? talk to my mom, find out how she's doing. She goes, I'm a fan of that, Neil. I'm like, what? I've been watching that uh, Spirits by the Graveside. I'm like, ah. Oh. So I'm like thinking to myself, she's going to be listening to this. So I got to, hi, mom, for one. Two, I got to make sure I don't cuss tonight. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll, we'll do our yeah. We'll do our best, Miss Lineweber. Now I hear that Miss Lineweber <laughs> is uh, my uh, number one fan. She is your number one fan. Uh, she asks, yeah, instead of asking how I'm doing, how's Neil? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You get a lot of phone calls like, "Hey, how's Neil doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. How are you?" But let's get into the show then, okay? We tonight are going to be talking about Mothman. We're going to talk about the beginning of Mothman. And then we're going to try to talk about the new Chicago connection with Mothman. Uh, but let me uh, talk a little about cryptozoology. Is the search and the study of animals whose existence or survival is disputed or unsubstantiated, such as the Loch Ness, Mon the Loch Ness Monster, the Mothman, or Bigfoot? Let's start us off at Point Pleasant, West Virginia, November 15th, 1966. Two young couples witness a huge winged creature attacking the car, scratching at the car. They recall a seven foot to eight foot tall, very dark creature with red eyes. That is crazy, man. So that brings me to you, Jack. Jack. Please fast forward us just about almost one year after. On the Silver Bridge on Ohio on the Ohio, Ohio River in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Tell us what happened, Jack. Yeah, so it was uh, it was just before Christmas and there was uh, several cars on the bridge. So the bridge was packed uh, with cars with uh, people, you know, getting ready for the holidays and whatnot and um, the uh, the bridge actually collapsed, mm -hmm. and all these cars, all these people fell into the river, um, the Ohio River, and what ended up happening was uh, 46 people were drowned. That's a lot of and, people, man. Um, that's a lot of people, yeah, and not, not all the bodies were, were recovered as mm -hmm. well. And I heard that um, uh, they had a hard time getting that bridge back together because originally the bridge was uh, built in 1929 and was actually described to last 100 years, but it didn't even reach 40 years. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, as often happens with, like, you know, these big industrial projects that took place, you know, in the, in the early 1900s, you know, took place during and the post-industrial revolution. Unfortunately, a lot of them weren't adequate. And, and that's what happened uh, to the bridge. Uh, I know there were some reparations even after um, after the bridge was built, but it, it you know obviously it wasn't uh, good enough to to do what it was supposed to do. And um, and uh, it, yeah, that you know it collapsed. So tell us about the Mothman. 
of the sightings of the Mothman, how this is very important to the Silver Bridge uh, collapse, please. Yeah, so you have to go back a little bit. So um, the journalist John Keel uh, arrived on arrived in Pleasant, West Virginia, in 1966 because uh, all these reports, uh, all these various paranormal phenomena reports were coming out of there. <laughs> it wasn't just, it wasn't just uh, uh, these Mothman. It was actually a slew of other things. There was a UFO sightings, um, whole blocks experiencing poltergeist activity, um, other strange creatures, um, you know, phone calls from the dead. What? And, um, phone calls from the dead? Yeah, so there was, yeah, phone calls from the dead. Wow. And uh, phone, also phone call, other mysterious phone calls from people that were living but claimed that they did not call the person that they called. So um, John Keel arrived on the scene and he started talking to uh, the residents of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And he's documenting all of these strange phenomena. And he comes to a conclusion that Point Pleasant at this time was experiencing some uh, vortex in the town. You have to remember, uh, Point Pleasant is a small town. It was, it was even smaller back then in 1966, mm -hmm. 67. Um, it was a, it's a small town, but you have, you have dozens and dozens of people experiencing uh, strange things. And one of the most curious of them was Mothman. Right. Uh, Mothman was said to be a being that was between six to eight feet tall with not what we would describe as a head, but more of a head that rests on the chest. Okay. With large, uh, ruby colored eyes that sit on the chest. Okay. Um, with a large uh, wingspan. Um, now, see, the wingspan is a little, it's a little tricky because some did describe it as more bat-like, some described it as more bird-like. Um, but a, a large wingspan, no arms, mm -hmm. uh, a bipedal creature, mm -hmm. and, and and no no distinct face. Right, and they said uh, some people said and, that um, it would stagger left to right, never really walking forward. Am I correct on that? Yeah, like it did. Um, some, some people describe it as a as a penguin like walk. Some describe it as you know, like as it was trying to learn how to walk. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the most famous uh, cases that came out of uh, the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant was uh, Linda and Roger Scarberry. Mm -hmm. um, they were uh, just a young couple at the time and they were with two of their friends in the back seat, and they went into what was known as a TNT area. It used to be a World War II uh, ammunition uh, factory, and uh, that was uh, since abandoned. And so, you know, a lot of the kids would go out there and just, you know, goof off and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they went, they, were, they drove over there, and they saw what, they didn't know what it was at first, you know, it looked like a bird or a bat, but they, you know, as they got closer to them, they saw it had large red eyes, that it was as tall as a man, and, you know, they freaked out, they sped away. Uh, the creature was uh, able to catch up with them, even though they were going, you know, 40, 50, 60 miles per hour, it was able to catch up with them. Wow, that's and, nice. uh And they were, they were terrified, they went to the police, um, it made the papers. The police were skeptical, obviously. And, uh, you, you know, even years later, decades later, Linda Starberry, when she was interviewed, she would say that she would never, she would never forget those eyes, those red eyes. Mm -hmm. They terrified her. Uh, she said that they were as large as, as the, um, headlights of a, of a car. Right, and there was many different eyewitness accounts before the disaster of the Silver Bridge. One eyewitness account was a young girl. Um, she was going out the backside of her house, and she said 
she described exactly what you're talking about in uh, her backyard, and she called out to her dad and told her uh, what she saw. Uh, so there, there's been a lot of other people in that area before um, oh, sure. before the Silver Bridge uh, thing, and also. I guess the majority of people who uh, started living in the area uh, came from, um, who were Celtics. And uh, a lot of the stories may have started with them where these things were seen, uh, from the research I was doing. Uh, have you heard about stuff like that at all? Yeah, the, the idea that um, Mothman could have been a, a banshee, mm-hmm. which is a, you know, a Celtic, Irish, um, mythological being that was said to shriek in front of a home um, foretelling the death of a family member. And since this alleged banshee or mothman was sighted all over the town, you know, it, w- it was you know, foreshadowing the death of so many uh, in that small community. Right. So, you know, it, it could be the idea that that, you know, these, these mythological beings, they travel with the people. So, you know, uh, these, these the descendants of the Celts, now living in present West Virginia, uh, feel attracted uh, to the things that were closest to their ancestors. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what I was looking up is, you know, is that it may have been something that's been around for a very long time, even before the Point Pleasant uh, Silver Bridge disaster. Um, one of the other things is there's a picture out there of the Mothman, supposed Mothman, a.k.a. Mothman, uh, on top of the bridge. Have you ever seen that photo? Yeah, I did, I did see that. Like, he's like, kind of... Uh, some people, just on that day... People said that they sighted Mothman tucked away, peeking out from underneath the bridge. Mm-hmm. And he was sighted around the bridge and, uh, around that day. Um, so, you know, that, you know, that's pretty terrifying. Yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, you see this bat-like creature with this wingspan of almost 10 to 12 feet flying around with red eyes. Oh, I'd have to... Uh, go hide and uh, call my mama. I don't know about you. But I would definitely uh, I would definitely uh, not be the person who's sitting there going ahead and taking a picture of her. I mean, that was a brave soul. And uh, the thing was that happened, and this is how the legend begins, and part of the story is that when they see the Mothman, a disaster happens. They link those two together. Am I correct on that, Jack? Yeah, they do. Um... You know, it, it goes back to the idea of the banshee that that's you know that's a very possibility of what Mothman was or is. Yeah. Right. I mean, could have just been ironic, maybe so. But you want to know what that actually takes me into where I want to do the Chicago connection on it now. Now I'm gonna bring in Steve. Now Steve, anywhere between 2015 2017, uh, there's been over about 90 sightings, probably more than that. In the Chicagoland area, can you tell us a little bit about maybe the first sighting in the Chicagoland area? Sure. And, you know, for our listeners, anybody who's uh, looking to find out more information, there's a website, singularfortune.com. that has a whole list of all the different sightings, um, and it's quite thorough. You know, around 2015 um, was actually the earliest that we start seeing um, the Mothman in the Chicago area. Um, this goes back to uh, a woman who was living downtown Chicago. She looked out her window and she reported seeing what she called a crow man. Mm-hmm. Um, a giant crow-like thing flying around is how she interpreted it. Um, there's a pause in sightings. And then we start seeing people um, hearing about or reporting this on the regular in 2016. Um, you have sightings of people taking out their garbage in places like Elgin, mm-hmm. um, the, out in Bolingbrook area, which are suburbs of so people who aren't familiar with the Chicago area. These are suburbs of Chicago. They're not far from Chicago, um, right on the outskirt. Um, all the way down to the Willis Tower, you know, we have a sighting 
that uh, this was in 2017 where a man he was outside took a look up the Willis Tower and saw what he said was a like a bird man yeah. jumping off the tower right. and flying away. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get a lot of these different um, interpretations of a man slash bird. Some even some of the reports even say a man bat. A man bat. Um, a man bat. Okay. Which I kind of thought was funny. Right. Um, in a way to put it. Um, so what is going on? What are people seeing? Right. You know, and uh, you've seen videos, you know, right, of uh, daredevils that mm-hmm. go up on yes. skyscrapers. Yes. yes, I have. And they jump off. They do like hang gliding or um, whatever. They have wings and they fly. Yeah, you know, my first thought is, well, that might be what was happening at Willis Tower. Well, Willis that would have been that would have been uh, that would have been in the news, like Chicago Sun Times or something like that, if that was right. person, you know. And, uh, and if that were the case, you know, um, what would be fun is to see like um, Spider Dan and somebody Spider, do that. You remember like Spider Dan? Like, combo. Oh, yeah, I remember Spider Dan. Yeah, remember that? Or, or, or um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, just with uh, the with. I'll always call it the Sears Tower, you know. Oh, you go on call the Sears yeah. Tower. Yeah, I'm sure Jack does too. But um, the Willis Tower, Sears Tower, has been known for stunts, is what I'm saying. Right. Um, but people have seen a um, giant owl man mm-hmm. have been reported outside of a bar in Melrose Park. Really? Sitting on top of a, a lamppost. Really? A, a bouncer out there. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so there's been a lot of different sightings, but they seem to have originated in the Chicagoland area more commonly in 2015. Mm-hmm. And when you bring up about disasters, now we haven't really had a disaster mm-hmm. in the Chicagoland area, other than like our commonly occurring ones of, you know, there's even know about the carjackings and the shootings, but that's like everyday life. Mm-hmm. Um, Nothing like a natural disaster um, has happened. I remember reading back, and this is where I might get a little too um, Alex Jones level conspiracy theory kind of. That's crazy. fine. That's fine. Go ahead. I expected. Uh, it you remember the <laughs> Romanian hacker Guccifer? Mm-hmm. Um, he was in the news about uh, these large uh, level hacking things. Um, he was part of the uh, George Bush's uh, self-portrait of him bathing, getting released, um, some of the Clinton emails. Um, there was an event called, I uh, hate to say it was my mom's listening, but there was a report of the, the fappening. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yes. Where <laughs> uh, actresses were having their private photos stolen off their phones and revealed on the Internet. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he, this hacker was famous for that. They wanted him. And uh, because he could get into these systems and get information out. And he, he mentioned something about uh, a plan in 2015 to uh, have nukes go off in the Chicagoland area. And, um, and of course, that never happened. And that's around the time and, uh, uh, the Mothman was being seen. Started, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Can I Maybe, correct you? May, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Jack wants to correct you. Go ahead, Jack. Um, just, just, uh, I just want to interject real quick. I'm, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Steve. Um, the, the first, the first Mothman sightings in Chicago occurred in 2011, and there was three of them. And then after that, they started up in in 20, late uh, 2016, going into 2017. I just, I just want right. to add that real quick. Sorry. Sure. And I see um, again on the uh, singularfortune.com site. Um, I do see those 2011 occurrences, and then there's a big pause, right? And then right. they report two at the end of 2015, and then we start ramping up a little bit more in 2016, and a whole lot of them in 2017. So I kind of look at 2015 as like the beginning of um, at least you know something's happening, right? There's a ramp up sure. of, of sightings, um, and who knows? You know what might have been going on. Is there always a disaster 
with the Mothman and the sightings. Well, so you know what? Um, one of the things that I read in one of the things is that in Michigan during the time, uh, but this is 250 miles away, uh, that one of the dams broke or something like that. But And there was no sightings. I did check to see if there was ever any, any sightings around the Michigan area. As far as I found out, there were none. Um, that's the thing is, the question I have actually for the both of you, and you started off actually, Steve, is that has there ever been a disaster? But then you bring up about this uh, guy who was a hacker. Could he been around here because there may have been a disaster that maybe uh, this Mothman, Batman, whatever man bat, maybe he foresees certain things. And for whatever reason, maybe it was all squashed. And it was never, because you, you, I believe uh, it was called a broken arrow, you told me, Steve. Well, yeah, there are actually um, 32 broken arrows that have been reported in the U.S. And by broken arrow, those are either nuclear accidents or mishaps, um, or worse, missing nukes. And in terms of missing nukes, there are six missing nuclear uh, warhead weapons and cores, uranium cores, um, from inventory mm -hmm. from the U.S. Uh, arsenal since 1950. This mm -hmm. goes to mishaps in 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, where nukes have gone missing never to be recovered. Mm -hmm. Like B-47 bombers uh, who were flying from the U.S. to Morocco. They were supposed to refuel up in the air, and they would just disappear off radar. Hmm. And the planes, the pilots, and the warheads were never recovered um, officially. Mm -hmm. Never recovered. Now, now, Jack. So, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, just that uh, you know, there are missing nukes out there, and it is a possibility that you know they could have been recovered. And this Guccifer character um, may have been reporting uh, something true, and maybe making it up. And maybe, maybe, the, was, maybe the uh, Mothman yeah. foresaw it. Yep. See, it's odd that it was around that time. Right. Now, Jack, do you know of any uh, things out there that could have possibly been a disaster between this time period to now? Because I believe the last time was October of last year. Am I correct on that, Jack? The last sighting? That's correct, yeah. In the Chicago area, yeah. Okay. Um, no, I would agree with Steve that they really hadn't, hadn't had like a major disaster in Chicago. I mean, you could argue Chicago is always in a state of disaster. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We haven't really had one like, like uh, the Silver Bridge and, you know, the present. Right. So I kind of take a little bit of different approach where I kind of feel that um, the sightings in Chicago actually aren't you know, the same as the Mothman of Point Pleasant. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they, there's a possibility that they are two different uh, phenomena. And you know what? Um, I'm going to, I want to get into that. Believe me, we're going to actually head into that. Uh, but one of the other, okay. question, one of the other questions uh, I wanted to ask was, is there a similarity, Steve, uh, between the 9-11, and believe me, this is going to lead into what you're just starting with, Jack, is there anything that had, there was a sighting on 9-11 or before 9-11 of the Bothman? Am I correct on that, Steve? There were some um, sightings even after 9-11 uh, happened, like shortly after. But yeah, people were seeing um, the Mothman. And um, one, uh, one guy, uh, Steve Moran in New York, uh, is known to have uh, gone out um, right after the towers um, fell, taking pictures. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people went out there and did that. They were taking pictures of uh, rescue workers, uh, what they couldn't believe. You know, they were seeing um, before the buildings even fell, right? All of the first responders, um, people looking up in the sky, all the rumors. They saw they're taking pictures. And there's a couple famous pictures that uh, Steve Moran took and put up on the Internet um, of a what looks like a, to me, it looked like a pterodactyl. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, as he explained it, he, he says it looked like an angel to him, mm -hmm. uh, a big winged um, creature. Mm -hmm. um, 
And in his mind, he thought of it as an angel um, sent down to maybe observe or protect. And we all know what a fallen angel is. <laughs> right. Um, so then we get into what are cryptids and so forth. Like, there have been a lot of sightings, um, even with 9-11, mm -hmm. before 9-11 even. Also, you know, Chernobyl had Mothman sightings mm -hmm. before the meltdown, as well as uh, Fukushima. Um, a week before the Fukushima meltdown, before the earthquake and tsunami occurred, there's uh, two, and there were two gentlemen who were walking around the nuclear plant, mm -hmm. and they felt a whoosh go by them. And they described what they heard after that as like uh, the sound of old rusty brakes that on a bus that needed to be repaired, like mm -hmm. a big screeching sound that got their attention. And they turned around, they saw this winged creature mm -hmm. um, over the plant. That, that winged creature then circled the plant about seven times. Wow. Before, before disappearing. Anyway, they kind of like thought that was really weird. And then they started to question what they saw. Mm -hmm. A week later, uh, the events of the Fukushima power plant, oh, you know, uh, happened, and that's when they started looking into what they saw, and they believe that it was the Mothman. So. Those are pretty recent tragedies. That That's, have happened. Yeah, in the timeline, I guess it is recently. Yes. Yeah. In this, well, Chernobyl a little further back, but still. It's still in our, you know, it's our um, timeline. Yeah. Yep. But uh, uh, during our lifetime. Now, let me get to. <laughs> and, let me get, oh, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, there's uh, there's occurrences that are happening not just in uh, the United States and the Midwest, right, in the East Coast, Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are happening around the world. Sure. And so that brings me into Jack. Now, Jack, in the beginning, you talked about that in Point Pleasant, uh, West Virginia, that other sightings were seen, UFOs, uh, possibly a vortex in the area, um, other things right. that were seen, Bigfoot, am I correct? Did you say that? Uh, yeah, other creatures, other uh, cryptozoological yeah, creatures. Crypto creatures. Um, I really do believe we live here in the Chicagoland area. We have Archer Avenue, which I, I my always thing is that there's ley lines laying underneath uh, Archer Avenue, and they activate when they want to activate. And we've had sightings in Tinley Park and Hickory Hills. I believe that there is some kind of vortex or something luring people. Could have been the Arlington National Laboratory that was here originally. What do you think, Jack? Oh, uh, yeah. The, um, are you talking about the Argonne Laboratory? I mean Argonne Arlington. Sorry, Argonne National Laboratory. I'm sorry. Pardon me. No, yeah. Um, the Argonne Laboratory is really interesting, actually, because uh, I was thinking about that, too, in connection to to other strange phenomena. But um, Argonne Laboratory does, they do very um, classified experiments. Like, it was in the news a couple, couple years ago where um, scientists were able to uh, create uh, invisibility technology. Mm -hmm. Well, that came out of Argonne. Mm -hmm. um, also, they were able to uh, create, you know, uh, free energy or, or gravitational energy. Um, that came out of Argonne as well. Uh, I mean, talk about talk about different forms of energy. Yes, in the Archer Archer area and in Chicago in general. I think there's a lot of ley lines mm -hmm. in Chicago, and that what that's what makes it so potent. We saw mystical, mystical energy. Um, right, and, and what's your original I, question? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's all good, dude. Uh, the thing is, so no, you're absolutely right. Could certain things that happen in the Chicagoland area, like the laboratory, the Argonne National Laboratory, could the ley lines? People start seeing UFOs. Could there also be a vortex in the Chicagoland area, like some people believed in West Virginia? I think so. 
Would both of you guys agree with possibly that uh, theory? Yeah, definitely. I think I think Chicago is a could be a center point for for a lot of you know paranormal uh, activity. You know, there's a book that came out. It's an auto sent book that came out in the 1970s. Uh, it was written by I believe it was the author is Brad Steger. It's called Psychic City, and it was about you know his journey through Chicago and interviewing you know psychics and people with a different psychic ability and how they also you know connected to Chicago. And Chicago is giving off you know um, giving off this energy that allowed them to hone in on their abilities. Um, uh, just today, I don't know if you saw my Facebook post, but I posted about the uh, Wabansi Store, which is now, um, it's a collection of the Chicago Historical Society, but they, it is suggested uh, by historians that it was used as uh, human, in human sacrifices, and it was found at Fort Dearborn, which is the birthplace of Chicago. So, you know, what if, what if, you know, there's this certain power in Chicago, this, this this dark energy that flows through Chicago because it's in the ground and it's been in there since prehistory. And it's drawing in uh, things uh, from the supernatural. Exactly. I, 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 I'm always very open-minded. I'm not going to say, yeah, that definitely is. I'm open-minded to the thought of it, and I'm open-minded to go out and get evidence of it. And I think that would be really, really cool to do. And uh, and I did read uh, that thing that you were talking about, your stone. I, I thought that was very, very interesting. I did listen. I, I think you put it out there around 4 o'clock this afternoon. Um, yeah. So then I got another question for the both of you. And I'm going to throw this to Steve first. The Mothman is described as a bipedal winged humanoid of a dark color, ranging from a dark brown or to a black, ranging from 7 feet tall to 8 feet tall with a wingspan of 10 to 12 feet with either reflective red eyes or glowing red eyes. Steve, what do you think is flying around the area? Your opinion. What I really... What do you think? <laughs> well, maybe, you know, it kind of shows up when um, bad things happen, right? Yes. Um, maybe he's just like a really lousy vigilante. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he's like trying to stop these things from happening, but he's really not that good at it uh-huh. <laughs> so like so he's like down in his mo- he's down in his mom's basement and he's like he's watching justice yeah. league <laughs> and <laughs> he's getting ready and he's going and he hears his mom going ah junior it's time to go to bed oh ma I'll, I'll be right there and then all of a sudden he's secretly putting on his batman costume going out to right. fight for justice yeah and uh you know i don't know he shrieks a lot you know, yells and screams. Now, I don't know. I, I'm kind of joking around, right? Like, of course. Of course. It, it sounds like Batman, you know? Sure. <laughs> like, you know, if you, when I first heard about the Mothman in the Chicago area, Chicago with all its Gothic architecture and stuff, I think, cool, oh, it's Batman, you know? Um, <laughs> that was my hope, my wish. Yeah, right? Actually, you <laughs> called me. You called me when uh, you started hearing all this yeah. stuff. You called me. Right, I did. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. dude, Batman. Batman. And, um, <laughs> but, Honestly, um, there it's interdimensional, maybe, right? Like some people believe that. I, I don't know if it's a physical, physically real phenomenon, right? But like, do you think that maybe people are capable of picking up on a disaster about to happen, kind of like animals, right? This is a more yes. primal thing, mm-hmm. right? Where animals can sense an earthquake. And all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But maybe we pick up like those vibrations psychically. Sure. And the Mothman is some sort of like symbol genetically embedded in us, like a monster, a myth from the past that our ancestors believed in, right? And it's like coded into our genes. So, like, when we sense a disaster is about to happen, you know, that collectively, we start to have people in our society start to connect to that energy and start seeing this Mothman. You know, Maybe. it's like a uh, a group hallucination, if you will. Someone did say that. I remember reading that that someone believed that uh, people were seeing some kind of group hallucination. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's always a possibility. 
Right. So what are you determining that what you believe it is truly? I, I think there's something there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, there's been no physical evidence of the Mothman collected um, for science to review, right? There's no bodies of a Mothman creature, you know, have been discovered. Kind of, we get into like the whole Bigfoot thing, right? Right. Um, is he real or is he not? Um, what we do know is that people are seeing this thing. Mm-hmm. They're, re- they're believing, they believe that they see it. The people who have been reporting these sightings sound credible. They, I'm not sure why they, they would make it up. Um, but this isn't just Chicago. This is, these are sightings around the world. They describe the same thing. A big winged man, humanoid, um, present close to him around the time of a major disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is definitely uh, something occurring um, in the perception of people, whether it's a physical um, thing out there or, or a psychic thing, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, but I think, I don't think it's a uh, fake. Okay, so it's something that should have to. We have to get more physical evidence on them. We need to, and I think we should search for the Mothman. Oh yeah. Okay. You know what, I'm going to bring that up in one second, but I want to hear Jack's answer, and then I want you to just listen to what I'm going to say because I think this is going to be okay. really cool. Jack, what do you think the Mothman is? You know, um, I think it could be. You know, the, the psychologist Carl Jung uh, wrote this long essay about uh, UFOs, and he didn't deny their existence, but he didn't confirm it either. Uh, what he said is that UFOs was a combination of, of two phenomena. It was, you know, our our own psychic projection that was colliding with external forces. Um we, we manifest things, but there is, you know, these archetypes that are around us, and they are able to manifest through our, uh, you know, our psychic ability. So, you know, I, I think, you know, that might be what's taking place with, with Mothman. You know, um, it's one of those things, he, he only exists if, if, you know, we're around, you know, but he is still very real. That's not to say that he's in our head. So would you think that he, he exists because we exist and the thought of him exists? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's yeah, deep, man. Think, that's deep. He, I like it. Yeah, I think I think he he needs us, and I think um, you could say that for a lot of mythological or cryptozoological uh, beings. Uh, I don't I don't categorize Mothman as as a cryptid because a cryptid is an animal that hasn't been categorized by science yet. I think Mothman might be much more intelligent. I think he's more humanoid, and he just might exist on a different plane of existence. Almost you know, kind of, almost um, kind of I like... Interviewed, I interviewed the witness for the for this year's tower sighting. Uh-huh. Um, his name is Guillermo, and he stated that he thought that it was a man that was committing suicide, but it turned out that it had wings, and it morphed from a giant insect-like creature to a bird-like creature and eventually flew away. Um, I also interviewed um, John Amatrino, who he's the one that uh, had his sighting in the, in the Logan Square neighborhood uh, in front of the bar, uh, ironically called the Owl. Uh, what he described, though, was a pterodactyl-like creature. Hmm. Um, so there's, there's definitely variations between, you know, between these different sightings. Right, and they're a little bit I, different, I, I, they're a little I, bit I, different, but they're all still kind of the same, correct? Yeah, like our thoughts form what these things are. Okay, all right. Now, I had to do some extra research, but I like doing it. Now, in the Philippines, there you guys, I'm sure you've seen these giant-like bats, uh, but they're only about maybe four feet tall, uh, but they do have a wingspan of about maybe five to six feet. Have you ever seen these things in the Philippines? Yeah. Okay. I've seen pictures, yeah. 
Okay. So one of the things that I got from uh, the West Virginia is that when, before the Silver Bridge collapsed, uh, people did see the Mothman in these caverns, almost like sewers. And the Chicagoland area is full of a bunch of uh, tunnels throughout the, the bottom of Chicago that we've built upon and built upon throughout the years. Um, could they be existing, or could it be existing inside one of these tunnels? Could it be just a giant bat? I wonder if it's just a species. Uh, but I'm always open to thought on things, um, and that's why we all give our own opinions on things. But could it be a species that has been dormant, or when I use the word dormant, I mean not really uh, seen or captured because there's a very small uh, amount of these uh, creatures. So when I see big things like giant bats in the Philippines, I'm saying, well, maybe, maybe because of all the uh, forestry that we have around here in the Chicagoland area, all those forest preserves, all these uh, mountains, not mountains, these big hills, and the caverns and this and that, maybe they're living somewhere. So I know, Steve, you were going to bring up some. So I have this idea for all of us, me, you, and Jack. What happens well, if we actually think, went out to go hunt one? Now, that's how, now, kind of what I was thinking. So this is, this is my idea, and tell me what you guys think of this idea. Now, we have audio that we can pump through. What happens if we did an echo system and we hit like at least three different areas and we use screeching noises like bats? And what we do is we use we change the vibrations on them and we just sit back and we wait. I think it would be a cool thing to do over the summer as like a little side project. What do you guys like think make of this? A, Go ahead, make, Steve. Make like a... Uh... Like a sexy bat uh, moth woman type yeah. of mating call. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll lure them in. What do you think, Jack? <laughs> I like it. You like it? Yeah, I like that. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. So if we pump, if we pump um, the sound into certain areas, like we have to find certain tunnels and stuff, and I think one of the main places where I think we should try is around the forest preserve area near the Argan, Ar the first Ar Argonne National Laboratory. I think that area there, and I know that I saw a video of certain areas, and they were all marked in green. So I think that would actually be something really, really cool. And if people would want to join us in this and come up with other cool ideas, I think they can send it to Neil, N-E-A-L, at GravesideParanormal.com, or Steve at GravesideParanormal.com, or go to Jack on uh, Paranormal Chicago, and join us. And let's go have some fun. I mean, what the hell, this is what we all like to do. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, like, we just want to take a picture of it, right? Or do we want, like, Mothman's head on the wall? No, we don't want to kill you know. something, man. We just want some okay. better evidence. That's what we want. You know, like, All right, I'll leave, I'll leave the bow and arrow at home. Right, so let me, let me get to this, though. So, uh, Jack, in 1976, an owl-like creature was sighted in the village of Maumon Cornwell in the U.K. Could there be different classifications of Mothman? in the world, just like a Bigfoot, uh, that we just don't know about. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. There's different classifications. You know, it's, it's hard to say without, you know, more reports and stuff. Um, you know, I like to take a scientific approach to, to things, so I, I don't want to go ahead and classify Mothman. But, yeah, I think it's a very, uh, very real possibility that uh, there are different types. There's, you know, the... The, the UK one was a uh, the description was similar to Mothman, but a little bit different as well, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And so hopefully, uh, you know, if if we can, maybe if we go do what we do, maybe we can uh, identify and make a classification. Now I know you have to go through the whole classification uh, system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, but let's just start with just a picture, can we? Let's find one and find one that's not blurry. You know, in this day and age, we find all these blurry pictures. I'd like to find one that just doesn't have any blurry. Now, one thing I want to bring up, um, uh, well, I want to ask Steve, what do you think? Do you think there's a classification probably? Uh, I mean, we have to get some pretty good pictures. And like you said, not blurry, close up. Yeah. This thing's flying around and moving pretty fast. In the original story, um, when he grabbed onto the car, right, Point Pleasant, mm -hmm. they were going like 75 miles per hour. Right, mm -hmm. but he still caught up. 
this thing moves fast sure. and it's high up so we might see something but in order to do a classification right we need more data and if an image is all that we have that image has to be pretty clear and pretty high def right it, it really does you know it's, it's it's going to take more than just one outing i i'm, I'm totally game to this you know to drop uh, some projects and actually try to do this in the summertime or make it like a singular summer time project i think that would be really we have, to, we have to catch it and take it home physically and take it home yeah <laughs> bring, no, it, bring it down bring it, bring it for you a know? barbecue at my house give us a bud light like, okay get some drones right with sure. a net You're right and uh yeah i don't know i don't know but you know getting a picture seeing if we could attract it that's, that's um, the thing is i want to see i want to see being, if we can attract something be, and being able to uh, replicate that, right? right? And have other paranormal groups go out where they are and see if they can get a Mothman to appear. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about is that I was doing some more research, okay? And in the 1970s, uh, through the National Cryptid Society, case file number 57, pterodactyl sighting in Delavan, Illinois, between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. in the 1970s. Now, people are seeing what they believe are a pterodactyl. And some people, when they see Mothman, they believe it's a pterodactyl. Uh, another one. Then again, 1999 in Roscoe, Illinois. And then the N NCS again, case file number 30 in Peoria, Illinois. I think something's going on in the Chicagoland area. Jack, do you think something's going on that's just more than the Mothman, like we talked about, that maybe we're some kind of zoning in on the supernatural? Yeah, um... You know, it, it also could be a uh, thunderbird. Um, Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, believed in uh, these giant birds called the thunderbirds, and it was usually sighted in, in the Midwest area uh, throughout Illinois. So, you know, these giant supernatural birds. Uh, yeah, and they're, they're supposed to, uh, like, heal or something like that, the thunderbird. Am I correct on that? Yeah, that's correct. And um, there's two different... Um, there's two different narratives on why it's called a thunderbird. Some say that because when it flapped its wings, it was so big that it sounded like thunder. Mm -hmm. uh, another was because it would show up during thunderstorms, rainstorms. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the other uh, sightings that we were talking about, I saw a guy on uh, Paranormal Chicago, your thing, uh, he was saying back in the 80s that he saw a Bigfoot on Archer Avenue. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, there was that, and then uh, we got the we also got the feral beast in uh, Sacred Heart Cemetery. People believe that there's a wolf-like boy who roams around the cemetery in the forest preserve around there. So it's a lot of interesting things that are going around uh, in the area. So, Steve and Jack, there are a lot of weird things in the Illinois Chicagoland area, from sightings of Bigfoot to Mothman to a feral creature on Keene Avenue, and very pre and a very pre pretty blonde-haired girl waiting for you to pick her up and take her dancing. This is my kind of town, Chicago, and I know it's <laughs> yours. And I want to thank both of you guys tonight for coming on and talking about the Mothman, and I'd like in the future to talk about some more cryptoids. Uh, are both of you guys up for that? Sure. Definitely. Definitely. All right, well, that is the end of our show for tonight, and I thank everybody for coming on and everybody listening. And once again, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, please uh, watch the Sally House that we put out Friday. I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, we are going to be having our event on May 8th. Once again, Jack, thank you of Paranormal Chicago. I want you to plug anything that you want to plug at this time, please. Yeah, uh, you can reach me at uh, jack at parachicago.com or you could find me on Facebook, Jack Chavez. Uh, that's Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-V. Or, um, and also my Facebook group called uh, Paranormal Chicago. And we're going to be posting, you know, uh, different events, ghost investigations, and, uh, you know, I update it fairly regularly. So, yeah. Good, good, good. And I, I like your I like your page. So everybody check out Paranormal Chicago on Facebook. It's a really cool page. Everybody's always putting up uh, things on there, and I, I find it very cool. Uh, Steve, as always, uh, I thank you for coming on. Uh, the creator of the Anahata Spirit Portal Box and Graveside Paranormal. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to plug yourself, sir? Uh, no, I mean, just, uh, hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a like, click subscribe, hit the bell, all this good stuff. Uh, we really uh, want to get our subscription up to at least 1,000 because Neil and I 
once we have a thousand subscribers, we can go live on our mobile phone yep. and bring you Man. some really cool, spooky things. And let me tell you, that's our life. Yeah. <laughs> Neil and I are always out there doing something fun. Yeah, and definitely. once we get a thousand subscribers, we can share it live with you wherever we are. And once again, maybe we'll be out there looking for the Mothman. You can join us. So that is mm-hmm. our show, boys and girls, <laughs> children of all ages. And as always, boo.